today I want to just go over another account of Jesus and how it affects us. And I'm going to be reading today from Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. And the name of today's sermon is Giving Birth to What is in Us. Giving Birth to What is in Us. How many of you know everybody has something inside of them? Everybody has it. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. 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 Well, let's start with Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. And most headings, they call this one the birth of Jesus foretold. The Bible still call this, this, this story of Jesus' birth. Luke 1, verses 26. It says... And we're not going to get too far yet. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Let's stop right there. For the full understanding of who Elizabeth is, we'd actually have to go back Luke 1, and we'd read from verse 1 to 25 to tell you who Elizabeth is. So we're not going to do that. But I will give you the cliff notes. How many of you know what cliff notes is? The shortened version. Elizabeth... was the cousin of Mary, who we're about to, to, to read about, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And also, Elizabeth was the mother of John the Baptist. So she had some good lineage there. Her husband was a priest by the name of Zechariah, and they had been praying for a child because both Elizabeth and Zechariah were of advanced age and had no kids. And the Bible also says they were both righteous in the sight of God. It so happened that Zechariah, being a priest, had a schedule of when he was to go and serve in the temple. And while in the temple, he was burning incense. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him, listen, God has heard your prayer and you're going to have a son. Praise God. But let's go back now. He's old. He's been childless all this time. Now this angel comes and says, you know what? You're going to have a son. What would be the natural question be? Which Zachariah asked. He said, how can this be? Because I'm a who? <laughs> you know, that natural question. But the wrong question to ask. Because you know what happened to him? The angel said, you know what? Because you even asked that question, you're going to be mute until what I told you comes to fruition. So... He was mute. After his time in the temple, he went home. And when he went home, the Bible says his wife then became pregnant. But, of course, I don't need to. Do I need to get in why how she became pregnant or do I need to go there? No? Okay, I just want to see if you guys are with me. <laughs> okay. Now, there are similarities between Elizabeth. And Mary, however, there is one glaring difference. And that is Zechariah was, was the father of John the Baptist. But we're going to see how Mary's, who's, who's uh, Jesus' father is. So let's read on. Back to that. Luke 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, we know who Elizabeth is. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, let me ask you, this happened to you. Greetings, James, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. That would, excuse me, me? Just like Fred says, I'm a gift. I was shocked at that. So imagine it says, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. First thing Mary would probably ask is, why? What did I do to be favored by the Lord, to be chosen by the Lord? You know, at least what did Mary do? Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Zechariah 
were called righteous. Elizabeth and Zechariah prayed and their prayer was answered. But what did Mary do to be chosen by God? Look at where Mary came from. Nazareth. Nazareth is what we would call today a one horse town. 30 years later, one of Jesus' disciples, look at what he said in, in John 1, 43 to 46. It says, and this is when Jesus is call, calling his disciples. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus is finding his disciples. Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What do you say about Nazareth? Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, come and see, said Philip. So even, look, third, it was a one-horse town now. 30 years later, it was still a one-horse town. So what did Mary do? She came from nowhere. What did Mary do? She was a typical teenager from Nazareth. There was nothing special about her, but she was highly favored. What did she do? The answer to that question is nothing. Nothing. So the question is, why did God choose Mary for the most important birth in the history of the universe. Look at Romans 9, 14 to 18, and this will give you an answer. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, listen to this, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on who I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy on and hardens who he wants to harden. Answer that question is why did he choose Mary? I don't know, but I know this. God will choose who he chooses to use for his purpose. God will choose who he chooses to use for his purpose. It wasn't about Mary. It was all about God. Mary did nothing. All right, sidebar. Side note, I'm going down a road. I'll come back, but I'm going down a road. How many religions that we see worship Mary? Right? The Virgin Mary. Oh, Mary. Oh, Mary full of grace. I just showed you that she did nothing. So why would somebody worship Mary? Somebody who did nothing, had no powers, had nothing. You know, and I'm not slamming Mary because as we, as we read through Mary, Mary is a very honorable person. But there was nothing special about Mary. Mary, came, Mary was what? From a one horse town. Huh? Nazareth. Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Utah, James? <laughs> Say yes, James. Yes. Say I did. Say I did. Come on, James. I'm setting you up, man. <laughs> All praise is to be given to God and nothing, no one else. Are you hearing me? You have these people running around, oh, the saints, they're worshiping angels, they're worshiping this, they're worshiping that. No, I don't care how good a person is, I don't care what they do, one person gets great. You have people, you have people being elevated, you have pastors being elevated, you have politicians being elevated because they did something good and they're literally worshipped. I'm here to tell you, if, if, if you're worshiping any politician, if you're worshiping any pastor, Except no, if you're worship, if you're worshiping any pastor, if you're worshiping any man, if you're worshiping the Mother Mary, if you're worshiping thing, you know what you're worshiping. You might as well be worshiping this phone right here, because this phone, at least maybe this phone, this phone will do more for you. 
God. Let God be praised. Period. 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 God will choose who he chooses to use. So let's look at verse 29 now. Luke 1 verse 29 tells us she's highly favored. Look at Mary's response. <laughs> Mary was what? Greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Why would Mary be troubled? Remember, here's an angel of the Lord and she is being called highly favored. Let me go back to think. Who knows us best? Us, right? Who knows every fault we have committed and every sin we have committed? Us. So we know all that about ourselves, right? Who knows us better than us? God. God is sending one of his angels to Mary when she knows her life is now exposed before God. She has every right to be troubled. If God came here and says, you know what? Neil, sit down. Let me examine your life. Troubled would just be the beginning of where I'd be. <laughs> for, for you guys that were here, when I, I preached on the message was lowering your nets. When Simon saw Peter, I mean, when Simon saw Jesus, this is what he said in Luke 5, 8. It said, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, go away from me, Lord, I am sinful. When you come face to face with God, I'm not saying to be scared, but no, you are imperfect and you are addressing a perfect God. You have every right to be. Mary was troubled. Mary had the same feeling probably Peter did. How many times have we been called to do something and fear and worry begin to creep in? She was troubled. Let's look at the next verse. Luke 1, verses 30. So she's troubled. You're, hey, you're highly favored. Wow, I'm scared. I'm troubled. But look what he says. He says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. In the midst of everything that we're going through, God will always comfort us. God comforts us in all situations. So how many of us go, I must, especially as kids, because you really look up to your parents at that time as kids, and you have to go to the doctor, you have to go to the dentist, or you have to do something that's fearful, and all it takes is your mother or your father to come and, and grab and hold your hand, and all of a sudden, you just feel calm. Situation hasn't changed. You just feel calm. That's what the angel of the Lord is telling Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Church, in the midst of any fear or turmoil, do not be troubled because he is with us. Everybody say that. He is with us. Let's continue. Luke 1, 31 to 33. You will conceive a child and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and you will be called the Son, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. I want you to see the order of this. She was troubled, the angel calmed her, and then after he calmed her, he revealed his purpose for her. The Lord will reveal his purpose for us when we are in position to receive it. The Lord will reveal his purpose for us when we are in 
position to receive it. Imagine in her troubled stage, and he says, listen, you're going to be this, you're going to be this, you're going to be this. It would have gone from panic to super panic, right? And look, look at what he told her. He says, she will give birth to a son. I'll get to that in a minute. His name will be Jesus. What? He will be son of the most high, which, which literally means not only will she give birth to a son, but this son will have the same DNA as God. Fred used the scripture last week, Isaiah 9 and 6, and we read it today for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Mighty Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Peace. I want you to go with me now. The scripture isn't up there. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. John, John 1, 14 says, and the word became flesh. So in the beginning was the word, the word was God, and the word was with God, and then the word became flesh. So the word was in the beginning, and it came all the way back down here and became flesh. So the word always existed. It became in flesh form in John 1, 14, right? So if Jesus was with the Father from, be for, Jesus was with the Father from the beginning, right? So we're going to see two things about the son. Jesus, human, was born through Mary. Jesus, God, always existed. You understand? Mary was the vessel. So when it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born through Mary. Unto us a son is given. You know why? Because he always existed. Are you with me? The angel tells Mary he will reign on the throne of his father, David. And you say, whoa, 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 whoa. But then you thought, you think back to what I just told you. He always existed. He will reign. Put up the uh, PDF. The question is, and let me show you another way. How is King David Jesus' father? Since Jesus always was, right? Jesus was here. Came all the way down here, and then bam, King David, right? Remember, Jesus always existed. He just didn't exist in flesh form, but he always existed. So he came all the way down, comes to Solomon and Nathan. On this side, he comes all the way down. Look how good Jesus is, how God is. Look, he comes all the way down, and even though Joseph is not his biological father, he is still in the bloodline of Jesus. Go the other way comes down to Joseph, which is the father of Mary, then had Mary. So when it says, and in the Bible, when you see son of, that doesn't mean the direct son of. The son of could be your great, 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 grandfather. If they're in direct line, they can say your great, great grandfather is the, you are the son of your great, great grandfather. You with me? Okay. Then, after that, it says, he will reign forever. Now, imagine if the angel had told Mary all that before, before her, before, she would have freaked out. But if I was in Mary, even though the angel of the Lord may have called me and said, yes, the Lord is with you, when the angel would have told me all this, I'd have started freaking out again. I'd have, I'd have been, they'd have had to call me a second time. The last thing he told her, he will reign forever. Basically, everything that the angel told Mary that was going to happen was literally supernatural. It wasn't natural. But you know what? When, it's, when, when everything is supernatural, do you know that's where we know the Lord is speaking to us? Put this, this slide up. We will know when God speaks to us because what he wants us to do will not be humanly possible in our own strength and determination. We will know, listen to this, when God speaks to us because what he wants to do, we'll, we, we will not be able to humanly possibly do it. And you say, okay, since I can't do it, you know why, you know why God does that? So we can't depend on ourselves so we can depend on him. 
It was so impossible that the most obvious question asked was in Luke 1 34. She says, how will this be? Mary asked, since I am a virgin. Luke 1 35, look at the answer. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. She asked a question. One thing I want you to know, when God calls you to do something, God is not looking at you and say, okay, now I've told you to do something. God turns his back and walks off. Mary asked, how will this impossibility be? And he says, the Holy Spirit will come on you. Whenever God calls, whomever God calls, God equips. Whomever God calls, God equips. Whenever God calls us to do something, the onus is not on us. Guess who it's on? God. The onus is on God because now it's going to come back to us, but he is going to equip us with all that we need to carry out what he needs us to do. So once God tells us that we should in confidence do what he says, why? Because he's equipped us to do it. And a lot of us miss our blessing because of unbelief. Because we can hinder what God wants to do because of unbelief or disobedience. Because, okay, God told me to do this, but I don't know if I can do it. Well, right there, you know what that's called? That's called unbelief. Look at Matthew 13, 53 to 58. Let me show you something. How you can hinder your blessings after Jesus is, is, is right there in the midst it says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there, coming to his hometown, he, he, his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Okay, let me stop right there. People ask you, this is a scripture that tells you where Jesus had brothers and sisters, okay? So Mary was not a virgin. Where, did all, where, did, where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town. In, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, in his own home. And he did not do many miracles because they were faith. See what unbelief does? Jesus is in the midst of them. And because they go back and remember, what, what, isn't this even this, isn't this boy a carpenter? Isn't this boy Mary's little boy? Isn't this the brothers of James, Joseph, and Judas? Isn't Jesus' sister living among us. How could this man be? How could he be able to do all these miracles? Church, that's what might happen to you sometimes. Regardless of how, how much Jesus is, is seed in us, sometimes they try to bring you back to where you once were. Neil's a pastor now, but wasn't Neil out there getting drunk every day? Wasn't Neil out there cussing every day? Yeah, but he's a pastor. Yeah, but, you know. But let me tell you something. When people do that, don't you don't need to worry because the only person that they're hindering is their own blessing. And he did not do so many miracles there because of lack of faith. You may ask me, Neil, how do, how do I know that Mary had faith? Look at Luke 137 for no word from God will ever fail. Luke 1, 37, no God, for no word from God will ever fail. God's word never fails. Look at Isaiah 55, 10, 11. 
as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. I want you to get this. What it says, as the rain and the what? Okay. When you have a, when you have a plant here, If I pour water in it, will it get directly to the root? Yeah, I'll go, bam. If I put an ice cube in here, will it get to the root? No, 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 eventually, eventually, right? It's, that's, how the, that's how the word of God operates. It says sometimes the word of God can be immediately, but sometimes the word of God goes the circuitous route. But it's coming. It says... As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to without watering. So when the word of God comes, it's going to do what it's supposed to do, right? Making it butter first so that it's yield and seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word. So just as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And then Mary's faith in Luke 1.38 says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word, that word I'm talking about, to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Then the angel left her. We're all Mary. How many of you know that? We are all Mary, not because... Not because we can birth Jesus. No, Jesus has already been birthed. But God has deposited something in each and every one of us that we all need to give birth to. You're not going to carry around that baby for 20 years, right? You're going to carry it around for nine months. God has deposited something in each and every one of us that's time stamped. Just like this baby can't go 12, 15, 18, 24 months in the womb. It's going to come out after nine. God has deposited something in each and every one of us that needs to come out. But I'm not special. Mary wasn't special. But I... Mary came from this one horse town, Nazareth. Y'all remember Mayberry? How many of you remember who, who know where Mayberry is? Andy Fife. A gun. One bullet, James. And you know where the bullet was? In his pocket. Mary came from a place like that, but Mary was used to birth Jesus Christ. What has God deposited in us to be birthed through us? If Mary can do it, so can you. Ephesians 2 said, Ephesians 2 10 says, We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, the baby, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You have something. We all have something. Now what you have or what you have, what you have, what you have is not going to be the same thing I have, but God has deposited something. Are you Mary? Will you be able to say, Lord, at your word? The Lord is using each of us as his vessel to represent him here on earth. Today, I want you to start thinking, what does God call me to do? If you don't know, trust me, 
You just keep on praying to the Lord and he'll reveal it to you. You don't have to be anything special. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to hold a, 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 a big time job. If God can use a person like Mary, and I'm not disrespecting Mary, he can use you. He can use me. He chose the ordinary to birth the supernatural. If he used Mary, he can and will certainly use us. Church, the Lord wants to use us all. And he showed us by birthing Jesus through Mary. The question we all need to ask ourselves, or questions we need to ask ourselves, what is he birthing in us? And the second question, what are we going to do about it?